Yes, good day. <laughs> good day. Me day, man. Don't feel away, me day. This is the stepping razor. Very unusual version of the stepping razor, but we have a work with it still. We have a work with it. You know, the tune we played before, when we start out with that tune by abridging Michael Tuff out of England, and then the next one we play was abridging him, Buzz Rock. Hey, Buzz Rock, me love that tune there, you know. Yeah, me love that tune there, Buzz Rock. Bringing up a child and we to the child. Yeah, man. And now we're up on Josie Wales and Busy Signal before the news. So, uh, here we go. This is the stepping razor. As I said, it's a different kind of stepping razor. You know, for those of you who don't hear, but them roll out them vaccine in England. Yeah, the first person to get it was a 90-year-old woman. I tell you, 90-year-old and the next man, the, the woman was 90 year old, and the man, the first man who get vaccinated in England, hear him name? William Shakespeare. <laughs> him name William Shakespeare. So it continue. You hear that? They might tell you now, they might give you a warning about it because there's something happening. Them say British regulators said people with a history of serious allergic reactions should not receive the bio and take biotech Pfizer COVID-19 vaccine. Regulators revealed two reports of possible allergic reactions from people who received the shot. And the first day of the country's mass coronavirus vaccination program. So them tell them I look into it to find out what is it that caused that allergic reaction in the two people them. So, as, I, as we say, it really a guan. Now, I'm going to stop it. And we hear now say, a whole heap of people now who in America decide to say they're going to take the vaccine. I don't know if it's because they say the amount of death around them. But me I tell you, America is a death house now. Terrible death thing are going over there, you know. And... We hear that it now reach us, so, I mean, not the, not the debt, <laughs> the, the vaccine. Well, you know, the debt raised because of the thing where they have the other day, the Thanksgiving, because seven days after now. And it raised really, like, them did hear, well, them did, they were told not to travel. People was told to, not to travel, and people say, well, you have to have a Thanksgiving, and now, and now I go visit my parents. Well, so said, so done. It raised up on them, I mean, like, thousands of people. And I think, really and truly, it affects a whole lot of people psychologically, especially the, the caregiver them, who demongs the people them, who are help the people them, and then the next day them come, them see the people them dead. That really is devastating to anybody. So we now go get it, well, not we, but the government now go get for bring it until maybe... Near to the end of next year. <laughs> all these arguments about vaccine and, you know, people have got mandated and all them really. Apparently, it don't look like we're going to say the mandating are going, but we are told that the government of Jamaica get 270,000 for really deal with the vaccine thing. But when we look at where are going and all, they must say the second half of next year before it reaches us, so because, you know, America have to take care of them one first. America have to take care of them people first. That is what me hear Donald Trump say. And I will if America and agree with him. Say you can't go ship with the thing for help we. We are going to help we given where we are now. And then you come tell me now, say you're going to get other country. So Jamaica, anyway, anything where you do for prevent it or keep it away from you, just keep doing it. Keep doing it because them say. For those of you who that depend on a vaccination, you know, when you go skok, <laughs> and maybe when the vaccine cup, it going to burn up. Not going to cook, but it going to roast and bake. So we just tell you, you say, according to them projection, the vaccine is not going to reach until next year, about June or so. So meanwhile, you know what to do. You have been told what to do, so just keep doing it. This is the stepping razor, the art of war. Yes, you know, <laughs> this is not funny, but it's funny. 
for all the people them who are planned to take the the vaccine you know have at least eight months for find out if you know should I take it for real because by that time you have millions of people who get it yes by by June millions especially in America millions of people are gonna take it so True, we now get it until June, July, and all them way there. We can't see if it work. <laughs> if it work. I mean, we have all two years, three years to find out if it work, too. Yeah, you yeah, understand? We have three years ago, and because of them things, they have a little retroactive kind of way about it. So, for those of you who... Oh, kind of want to take it but don't know because you're not sure as we say you know up till the middle of next year you see how it reacts for millions of people in england and america and other places yes so yes that's why we are follow we are going in a utopia i don't know much people are follow we are going in a utopia you know but as some serious war are going in a utopia and a whole heap of virginal sisters we have over there in our Jamaicans, in our Chachamani, and Addis Ababa too. So we have to really watch what's going on. So we want to play a first clip, a first clip about really what is happening here. Given that the Prime Minister the other day did get a, a Nobel Peace Prize because for years Eritrea and Ethiopia was at loggerheads. And now him, him, him ushering a new era in Ethiopia. Where we see all each Eritrea and a giant theme army and a fight the Tigre people. Him. So we want to play this clip here from BBC and then we go and play one from Al Jazeera after, if we have time. If we have time. So. Here we go. To now. Ethiopia, Here where Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed has announced a quote, final military operation against the defiant Tigray province in coming days. The federal government has carried out what it calls surgical airstrikes on the Tigray capital of Mekele and has denied reports of casualties. Ethiopian leaders have so far resisted international pressure for mediation with the Tigray rebel forces. But fallout from the two-week conflict has the potential to destabilize the entire region and has already kicked off a humanitarian crisis. These are the weary faces of a conflict that is spilling out beyond Ethiopia's borders. Aid groups say 25,000 people have now fled to Sudan since fighting broke out. Half of them are children. Some may not see their fathers or husbands again. We came with the clothes on our backs. I don't know where my husband is. I've been looking for him for five days. I don't know where he is. I don't know what happened. There was heavy fighting and many people died. After that, they told us to leave, so we fled. Everyone did. Ethiopia's government says its fight is with rebel groups in the rebellious Tigray region. The state TV pictures claim to show its forces liberating towns, but hundreds are reported to have been killed. Officials in the capital have resisted calls for external mediation. We don't need any mediation until we bring the setting leaders to court, because uh, um, any mediation would incentivize... Uh, Impunity and unruliness. Tigray TV appeared to show captured Eritrean troops with whom rebel forces have also been fighting. Ethiopia says some of its soldiers have also been taken prisoner. Capturing our soldiers, our commanders, generals. We don't know where they are now, truly speaking. We don't know. Our commanders, they are in jail. We don't know. Maybe they are not alive. Ethiopia's Prime Minister has promised a final military operation in the coming days and said he's ready to reintegrate the swelling numbers of refugees now trying to survive on the banks of the Tekezi River in Sudan. 
For some background on this story, I'm now joined from London by Ahmed Soliman. He's a researcher with the Africa program at the Chatham House think tank. Uh, Ethiopia's prime minister issued a deadline for Tigray's militia to surrender. He says that has just expired. So what can we expect to happen now? Well, it's it's difficult to know where this conflict is going. The situation has been evolving very rapidly, of course. Um, we've had uh, intensified military action throughout Tigray in, in the west, uh, and and we're seeing you know the numbers of reported casualties rising into the hundreds, if not more. Uh, what we have also is ground fighting uh, taking place and, and and troops advancing onto the regional capital. Uh, Michele. So the Prime Minister, uh, who has largely controlled the narrative around developments, has asserted that this military action will be swift, uh, but, but many people think that this could become a much more entrenched and protracted conflict, uh, one which uh, turns uh, with the TPLF uh, be- becoming an insurgency movement in a very difficult terrain, a mountainous and, and rugged region. So there is there isn't really uh, i guess uh, an understanding of whether this operation which is being taken is one which is to submit the tplf so that they eventually come to a, a negotiated settlement in a very weakened position or one which is following the stated aims which is to remove the tplf administration from tigray and and provi- um, and replace them with a pr- provisional administration well, you have said that Prime Minister Abiy coming into leadership was really a dramatic change that flipped the power dynamics on its head. Is he risking to destabilize the whole region there? Yes, I think that there are wider regional implications and, and the possibility of protracted conflict uh, we're already seeing uh, could, uh, could have uh, really terrible effects for the broader Horn of Africa region, for East Africa, uh, an area which has seen cyclical uh, conflict over many decades uh, and which was just, I think, under as well the emergence of Abiy's leadership beginning to look towards increasing integrations and stability. As your report shows, and and unverified uh, uh, reports of Eritrean fighters being involved in alongside the federal government forces, but what we do know uh, and has been admitted is that the TPLF have said that they have targeted um, the the Eritrean capital as well as uh, border positions uh, with missiles. Uh, We also know that uh, Sudan, uh, as as another neighboring country, has its own very delicate transition with a civilian military administration and the influx of tens of of thousands reported by the UNHCR, uh, up to 25,000, as your report put it, increasing every day, potentially into hundreds of thousands of, uh, of civilians fleeing the conflict in Sudan, uh, could have a, a, an impact on a region which has its own intercommunal tensions mm. uh, and which has been experiencing its own travel, troubles, which could, could have a broader impact on the Sudanese transition. A brief, brief answer, please. Do you see any solution to this? Any prospects for international mediation, perhaps? And who could do that? I think the timing is right. Uh, needs to be right for mediation at the moment. The federal government has said that it is not open to that. If the conflict becomes worse, if it becomes more, more protracted and, and losses are, are felt on both sides, there could be an opening and traction for negotiated settlement and, and bringing a truce to this conflict. I think the, the international community needs to continue its strong messaging to de-escalate, to, to bring truce and to allow humanitarian access. And they also need to prepare who the mediating team would be, uh, whether that would be uh, mandated through the United Nations with with, uh, African uh, statesmen uh, in charge, such as the the AU chair, uh, Cyril Ramaphosa, and the the IGAD uh, chair, um, Prime Minister Abdullah Hamdok. So I think the the only way forward for for Ethiopia really is through inclusive dialogue Mm. and through coming to a negotiated settlement. Ahmed Salamat, in London, thank you for this. Yeah, that was a, a broadcast from the BBC about the developing issues that is taking place and the, the war, because I call it a war, it's tribal war. Yes, tribal war taking place and 
it can, as you hear the man say, it can destabilize the whole region. And you know, the whole region is a big part of Africa, they saw. Yes, big, big part. So, all this thing are happened, how it reached a level here, we want to shift over to a next clip from Al Jazeera talking about the genesis and the beginning of this this craziness that is going on. Can I remember a few years during Evil Island last year, I in Eritrea and Ethiopia was at Lagerheads. I know this Prime Minister come and him, him create a vibes with Eritrea. You know, because Eritrea break away from Ethiopia. And the thing was that the whole of them is Ethiopian, really. And we can't say, oh, these countries get broken up by ex Mr. Johnson. Who is Mr. Johnson? Okay. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> well, anyway, sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah, sorry, Bridget, sorry, you know, because. May I tell you all the things I got to do? Remember these things. Good yeah. afternoon. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon, Mota. How are you doing? Well, I'm okay, you know. Well, I think it's a way for me. I don't remember. I never ever remember about this interview, yeah. But the tongues of them remind me. Yes, and we're still on. We're still on. Good, 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 good. Yeah, all right. Well, I can tell the people them where I go on now. There is, all right. I, I should have make you tell the people them where I go on and how I get involved in life because. You tell the people that we are going. Hi, good evening to your listeners. I'm representing Trees That Feed in Jamaica. It's an organization that we're promoting the planting of fruit trees that will feed your family and create business and have your children take good care of the environment. We have been working for quite a number of years in Jamaica since about 2009 going on. And our work has spread to Haiti and parts of Africa and India. We are in the um, we are in the Pacific area also. We we promote um, the planting and the production of a number of assorted fruits. With what breadfruit is our flagship crop. And why breadfruit? Why breadfruit? Why breadfruit? Breadfruit. It's our flagship crop because breadfruit. One tree can feed a family of four for even two generations. A tree will live for up to 40 years or more yeah. and produces constantly. And right okay. now, there, there are a number of um, interesting things going on with breadfruit, even here in Jamaica. The flour produced yeah, yeah, from breadfruit yeah, yeah. is um, gluten-free. And you know, there are quite a few people who cannot handle gluten none at all like in your regular wheat flour yeah. so so we are trying trees that feed um, started by Mary McCocklin the Jamaican lady and her husband they, li- they live in Chicago Illinois and that's that's where they operate from they they seek funding from people donations and they use it to purchase trees in Jamaica and give them out to farmers, individuals, households. You will remember that so you partially got involved because you know we, you were able to pilot the handing out of fruit trees to the organic market in, in Babylon. <laughs> yes, and that was wonderful because even I wasn't there at the moment when you come, but that, I was told that about an hour since after you gone, all of the soccer them left me. And you okay. came back the ne- I came, think you came back the next week, Carl tell you, say, bring more, and you bring more. And, and yes. I, I'm glad if I could have continued to get them. Because people... Yeah, well, are, we are willing to work with you, man, giving you suckers each, each week or even each month for the organic market. Because imagine what will happen. Three years from now, all those trees that you have put in are going to yes. go into production. Yes, yes. Oh, and you know that there's a next market there. There's a next market there now. So you could have bring twice the amount now because there's two days there. And the next market on Sunday deals with plants. You okay. know, so. We, well, we will talk to trees that feed. And as you know, they are, they are an organization which thrives on donations. So it's based on what is donated and how they can give. But they will give you a card in 
to their means and yeah, what can be yeah, done. Man. Yeah, yeah, man. I tell you, say, people respond to it quite well, man. People respond to it. Because it's true, yeah, you know, it's true, man. yes. It, it has been going good in Jamaica all over, too, you know. We, we, because trees, you know, are uh, food trees. Right now, food is to travel along the highway. Apple, jackfruit, yeah. gillette, Aki. sweet stuff. Aki, Aki. 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 it's been sold all along, and, and it's because of our initiative. Every yes, tree yes. that we give out, we know will become a business for somebody. So a whole for people. Right. So, yeah, man. so that's how we do it. Well, I am willing to take part as much as I can because that is my party here, you know, you know. We want to get the people them planting that future generations can come and really recognize how important it is to have, you know, a fruit tree in them yard. You know, you have fruit trees yeah. where people are eating half a few years and they never plant. Every time I see a man up sell a you know, I tell him, right. tell me something, you ever plant a hockey tree yet? And none okay. of them never plant a hockey tree yet, but they might live half of the hockey them now. $200 right. right. dozen, $250 dozen and all of them, really. But so it's right. very good. And you, you are doing your part greatly right now, because having me on to really tell people about Trees That Feed, which is an organization, which is a lifelong because we also help people to start their own little business in the trees that they produce from. So we help people, we give them small meals, we help in, in Haiti, we, we, we buy flour that is made from the breadfruit and we get it to produce forage and meals for children. We call it agro-industry. Agro-industry. Right, right. That is what I think they might have been promoting on this program, you know. Because you said, you know, some plant, plant food, and when flood come, the whole thing watch away. Some bridge, you know, oh. my top, this at St. Mary, they saw. Them say, the whole of them plants, them banana, them and plant, and watch away. Them have to start all over again. So, right. we have to find a way out to preserve these plants that we have here now. We find another industry that will best be able to serve with when flood come or when drought come, you know, that we have food still, you know, we can't keep like, importing them, you know? The only other industry is a big part. We have, we have all a young lady right now in Jamaica, breadfruit chips, lovely product. There is a nice product that a young lady out of uh, um, Puerto Rico is doing breadfruit called Tostones. It's similar to what we do in Jamaica, it's press planting, and if you walk in the um, the supermarket out here, you will see at St. Mary J JP Food. They are yeah. promoting Tostones too, which is a breadfruit product. We have breadfruit flour. There's a guy who's doing, I think, a patty. We have a number of other processing. And what we want to tell you, store the breadfruit, man. When, when breadfruit is in season, I just say, store it. Yeah. Store it. Make flour, put it down. Don't make it drop off of the tree and waste like we're doing in Jamaica. We need to... No, but we're well, the one on the one. I tell you something, a whole heap of people don't know this, you know, but it's the ripe breadfruit. It can make shake, you know. It can, yeah, it can make? Because it's sweet, shake, shake. Like in the morning, yeah. a ripe breadfruit, we, we mix it with some nuts and blend it in your blender. It's a nice shake, and, that, you know. Right, and there is a... Because it's sweet, um, it's sweet. Yeah. There's a wine... That is being made, I think, in Puerto Rico from breadfruit, and I'm almost certain it might be more the right for ones that they used to do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Come on, it's other right. processing is the way to go, Muta. Muta. Definitely, we definitely. Right there, I'm trying you know. to find out who going to eat the tall to move all of them Keenland places and plant rice in them. Because we, we know we, rice, we, we eat rice more than all the time. I that, you know. Eh? Trees that feed, trees, trees that feed are champion in a lot. We have one large farmer in West in Hanover now that is moving all the old tree land into fruit trees. And no, not fruit tree. In Roaring River in uh, Westmoreland. No, no, I talk about fruit tree, not talk about rice. The plant enough oh, rice. That is the government forte. They're going to no, me know, me know, but because I so, you know, me don't say because I keep saying it over the years. That right. Jamaican you have enough rice and it's really terrible if you have imported from Guyana and, right. and Uncle Ben and Uncle Ben did a long time, you know. So right. we need to deal with something else. But the fruits very important, Reggie. Very, very important. Very now, food security, food security is, yes. is, is the top. 
Yeah, All right, so we can talk as we can get the next portion again. Because we say we have two markets, you know, where we can't deal with, and it's two of them is the same place. So if you bring someone, we don't get through, if you don't give it the whole of them, they want the one day. The next day we can't give it, give it them. So I don't know when you can right. do that still. Well, well, we're going to organize that quickly because you know the market days will get into it. Um, we won't be able for this weekend because... Well, if it's not this week, we have to wait. We have to wait a little while because I think the, the Sunday market is not going to be for the rest of the year again. All so right. we have to well, wait for that. Very, very yeah, yeah, man. I will keep calling you and get the list. Of course. And if people want to buy fruit trees meanwhile, they yeah, can run down to my nursery at Denby on the showground. Yeah, we Monday to Friday. Yeah, then be on the showground. And we okay. sell two trees. So, right. so that's where you are every every day? Every day, Mondays to Fridays. Our nursery is there. We sell a whole range of fruit trees, about 19 different fruit trees. Ah, here we go. 40,000 trees there. Text me, text me your number. I wish by your day. That's if, WhatsApp me. That's if anybody call me. I want to contact you. I can just give them, them give them your number. I will do that shortly. I'll WhatsApp it to you. Can we have your link? And yeah, man. Bless up again, man. You've been doing a good work. Yeah, man. Give thanks, Benji. Glad for, for the link up, too. Yes. All right, sir. All give right. thanks. All right. Bless up, my brother. Bless yeah, up. Man. Cool. Yes. Right. I tell you, sir, it, it's wonderful. If it knows that these things is happening... And even though we don't advertise myself and all them really, but those little things is very important, you know. When we ask them for the tree, them, it's a truck. <laughs> it's a truck we see driving at the market. And when we take them out, man, it's like everybody grab them, man, you know, breadfruit, star apple, kneesberry, apple tree, all of them, aki tree. So, it's a continuous thing. So as we tell you, as you hear we tell the person, say, we're going to continue to really support that. That people can have more plant, we plant more tree and get more fruit years down the line. Where we don't have a ball out, but we have to import this and import that. Or talk about we're hungry. And I tell you, man, it's sweet where you have mango and pear and breadfruit. Hey, mango. Breadfruit, breadfruit and aki, breadfruit, aki and pear, ripe banana and pear. May I tell you, man, it's sweet. So, yes, you have no excuse. No excuse. No excuse. So, that is what we are promoting. This is the stepping razor, the art of war. Thousands of yes. refugees have crossed into Sudan. The okay, so is bound to rise. The, the next thing we're deal with now is coming too quick. <laughs> coming too quick, power. <laughs> coming too quick, power. We have to introduce what we are going on. So. All right. A while ago, we just played a BBC report about the war, the continuous tribal war we are going on in Ethiopia. And it, is, it is intensifying. It is intensifying. And it's getting more bloodier, and refugees running across the border into Sudan and all these places from Ethiopia, which will impose a problem in Sudan because you have Sudanese that run from Sudan to, you know, and then it will try in the war with, 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 with the government of Ethiopia. So we want to play this clip and you know, to make the people them listen to what this is happening here. Because if we can line it up. Yeah, we line it up. So here goes. Yeah, here goes. Let's talk about the fighting in Ethiopia. The government's launched a military offensive in the north, in a region called Tigray. The conflict could turn into a civil war. Thousands of refugees have crossed into Sudan. The death toll is bound to rise. At the center of it all is Ethiopia's prime minister, a Nobel Peace Prize winner. War is a epitome of fail for all involved. He would know. Abi used to be a soldier who now has another fight on his hands. So how did the fighting start? And what is this conflict really about?
Ethiopia is a huge country with many ethnic groups and political parties. Governing them has, at times, been difficult for the central government in Addis Ababa. There have been a few years of economic growth and relative calm. Now, though, things are starting to heat up. Here's why. Ethiopia is divided into 10 regions. They loosely represent different ethnic groups. Each one has some autonomy, but the center of power is in Ethiopia's capital. Tigray, where most of the fighting has been happening, is in the north. The government there is called the TPLF, and it even has its own regional army. They have a large number of militias and special forces that have been trained in hundreds of thousands. The TPLF wasn't just in charge of the Tigray region. It pretty much ran the country for nearly 30 years, even though the Tigrayans are a minority, just 6% of the population. The TPLF was the head of a coalition of regional parties, but many people saw it as autocratic and dysfunctional. They locked up hundreds of journalists and political dissidents. And massive protests eventually brought them down. The chaos allowed Abiy Ahmed, a young leader seen as a visionary, to get elected. He's from the Oromo, Ethiopia's largest ethnic group. Political prisoners were freed. Opposition parties were allowed to operate. He promised a new era of democratic reforms and an end to years of autocracy. Abiy even won a Nobel Prize for making peace with Eritrea next door. For as long as the TPLF was in power, Ethiopia was involved in a border standoff with Eritrea. So they didn't appreciate Abiy's new friendship with the Eritrean president. The Tigrays have got a long history of animosity with not just Isaias Afuwerki, the president of Eritrea, but Eritrea as a whole. So here's Prime Minister Abe with the Nobel Prize and all these ambitious ideas about how to keep the peace in Ethiopia and modernize the economy. Part of his plan was to disband the old governing coalition and unify the country under a new prosperity party. But some, including the TPLF, saw that as taking power from the regions. They also saw it as a power grab by Abe. The TPLF pulled out completely and they're accused of doing all kinds of things to sabotage Abe's success. They saw him as undermining the coalition, um, sidelining it, also moving very hard against the TPLF itself. Abiy Ahmed removed members of the TPLF from top positions. Many were arrested and prosecuted for corruption and abuse of power. So Abiy Ahmed, who at 44 is Africa's youngest leader, made a lot of enemies really quick. Two years ago, someone even tried to assassinate him. Ethiopia has become proud. So that brings us to what's happening now. Back in March, Abiy's government postponed elections because of the pandemic. But in September, the TPLF held one anyway. That escalated things. The parliament called the vote illegal. The TPLF said it didn't recognize Abiy as a legitimate leader. And TPLF forces attacked a government military base. So Abe sent in troops and it all blew up from there. 